Is it being now too la? Is it being now too la? In Bongi as a Kai. Um, when the city minister, in Donga Yazi, you are about how figure Pempo Macoloni, who business to go to the Kelly Little Nembo van. Wonga Dom Dulapa Ungu Kaila. No Zalana no Kaila. Who's out in Macaz? Who's out in Tatoba? Who's out in my mom? God, I get Bubu Bele Balape Kaya Obo. Um, we're now going to call upon Professor Hendricks from the History Faculty of the University of Forte to introduce our keynote speaker. I, I, I had no intention to enter with a bang. That was by accident. Yeah. Chancellor designate Reverend Makenkezi Stofile, the Chairperson of Council, Ms. Tandi Olain, Vice Chancellor Dr. Mbuyo Tom, distinguished guests. Whoever has observed Dr. Butalezi's appearances on television news in South Africa over the past few years would have noticed that he appeared on numerous occasions wearing the distinctive Fort Hare blazer. The simple fact of wearing the blazer speaks volumes. Is that fine? The simple, the simple fact of wearing the blazer speaks volumes about Dr. Butalezi's sense of association with and a long-standing loyalty to this historic institution. I believe I can state without equivocation that Dr. Butalezi has been one of, the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the greatest public ambassadors of this institution. I think it is entirely appropriate that we recognize this loyalty that stretches over decades with a round of applause as we welcome the son of Forte, <laughs> who is on the matter. Dr. Butelezi was a student at the University of Forte from 1948 to 1950. He enrolled for the BA degree and studied subjects such as native administration and law subjects such as Roman Dutch law and council law under Professor Z.K. Matthews, who made a significant impression on him. It was at Fort Hare that Dr. Butelezi became involved in the debates and activities on anti-colonialism and liberation as he was a member of the African National Congress Youth League and came into contact with fellow students such as Robert Sabukwe and Robert Mugabe. Dr. Butelezi was a resident of Iona Hostel and shared a room with, among others, Njoroge Mungai, who went on to become Foreign Minister of Kenya, and Orton Chirwa, who became Minister of Justice for Malawi. The 1940s were politically formative years at Fort Hare, as students grappled with the vexing realities of segregation and apartheid in South Africa and colonialism in the rest of Africa. In the face of a stifling Eurocentric curriculum, students devised their own extramural parallel curriculum of banned, more relevant, and more enlightening literature that was not part of the prescribed texts. Students often engaged in heated debates about the course of action and strategies for confronting apartheid and colonialism. The net result was that most students who graduated from Fort Hare had very clear notions and values about self-determination, about freedom, about human rights, about citizenship, and about a common humanity. Dr. Butelezi was integrally involved in these debates and ultimately, as a graduate of Fort Hare, was academically, intellectually, and philosophically equipped to deal with the political challenges that lay ahead in South Africa. We are made aware of Dr. Butelezi's adherence to this framework of values that I've outlined, that Fort Hare students embraced. When he was on vacation 
after completing his first year of studies at Forte in 1949. It's the same year that a communal violence broke out in Durban between the African and Indian communities. Dr. Butelezi immediately contacted the officers of the Natal Indian Congress to offer his services in trying to bring the situation under control. This unfortunate episode heightened Dr. Butelezi's awareness to the complexities of the South African demographic mix, and it is apparent that the path of reason would become a hallmark of Dr. Butelezi's approach to the massive political challenges facing especially the African community in South Africa. Prince Mangosutu Butelezi was born into the Zulu royal family as the son of Princess Magogo Ka Dini Zulu, King Solomon's sister, and Nkosi Matole Butelezi, the King's Prime Minister. He was educated at Impumalanga Primary School, Mahashini Nongoma, and then proceeded to Adams College Amanzim Toti, where he matriculated in 1947. In his final year of study at Forte in 1950, he took part in the student protests against the visit of, governor, of the then Governor General G. Brandt van Seyl, and as a result was rusticated from the university. When I drafted the original text, I wrote based on the sources that Dr. Butelezi was expelled, as most of the texts. But, but like the Reverend Dr. Kubule, I also bought the Sunday Times yesterday. I also read Dr. Butelezi's informative article, and Dr. Butelezi stated that he was rusticated from Fortier. So I'm erring on the side of course, uh, safety here. Okay. Although his academic progress, though significantly inconvenienced, did not stagnate, as the University of Natal allowed him to attend lectures and to sit for the Forte examinations. In this manner, Dr. Butelezi completed the BA degree and he attended the graduation ceremony in Alice in 1951, accompanied by his cousin, King Cyprian. Well, in simple sums, that is 65 years ago. Okay. On the advice of Nkosi Albert Lutuli, Prince Butelezi responded to the call of the Butelezi clan and returned to Marshabatini in 1953 to take up his hereditary position as in Corsi. In 1970, Dr. Butelezi was elected by the KwaZulu Assembly as Chief Executive Officer of the Zulu Territorial Authority. In 1972, Dr. Butelezi became the Chief Executive Counselor to the KwaZulu Legislative Assembly and from 1976 to 1970, 94, served as Chief Minister of KwaZulu. Prince Butelezi founded in Kata, here in Kululeko, Yesizwe in 1975, and campaigned for the release of Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners, as well as for an end to apartheid through negotiations. After the release of all political prisoners and the formation of the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, CODESA, Dr. Butelezi represented the Inkata Freedom Party in the negotiations for a democratic South Africa. After the first democratic elections in 1994, Dr. Butelezi served as the Minister of Home Affairs for two terms. In 1998, when the late President Mandela was in Washington to receive a congressional order, Dr. Butelezi served as acting president. In all, during the first 10 years of democracy, Dr. Butelezi was appointed acting president no fewer than 22 times. Dr. Butelezi continues to serve the people of South Africa as a member of parliament, as the traditional prime minister to the Zulu monarch and nation, and as the president of the IFP. Dr. Butelezi has seamlessly assumed the role of a senior elder statesman in parliament. This was no more evident than in the course of 2015 especially this time last year, when there were repeated disruptions in parliamentary procedure. In all of this, Dr. Butelezi stood out as a voice of reason in defense of true parliamentarianism, of constitutionality, and of democracy. Dr. Butelezi has been the recipient of numerous honorary doctorates, has, has traveled extensively throughout the world and has been the recipient of numerous honorary doctorates as well as uh, numerous awards, both nationally and internationally.
Prince Butalesi is a believer in Christ and an advocate of freedom for all people. He is married to Princess Irene Tandekile Butalesi, with whom he's had eight children. Ch Chancellor, Chancellor designate, the Reverend Makenkezi Stofile, the Chairperson of Council, Ms. Tandi Lane, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mvoyotram. After 65 years, an esteemed son of the university returns to share with the Fort Hare community his experiences as a Fort Hare graduate in the service of the people of South Africa and of Africa. It is a singular honor for the entire University of Fort Hare community to welcome Dr. Butelezi to deliver the centenary ZK Matthews Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ewe galoku, tisanganya kwa linyi belela 
wake mnati kumfuti tikumtoa na wala pefote haiti puma bwana college kuele 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 unani na wena iintoni na lento kutua kumona pizza yomona ivutu ewe galoku kutipungi yona yeyomtonya akosuma kosuthu buthelezi akosuma kosuthu Take a pong, Tianganesa, Kubunko Sanu Zizifo, Tutuko Yasu Buteles, Utema Tantu Luk and Diti, Owa Mutata, Kaese, Nabantu Boksan, Uye Ati, Uya Bonake, Taniselinam. Kuso fani gati ni seli ne chala le kulu le nguati. Itake take man le nyama kaske pule le ngaten kauma le kiskuanga kubaski ngeki titeta na wengosia. Adi gati. Tocha senza ushala pazi Ya kotani kanyamba Likula ngapa Himolo wangapa Siege nizkule zozbini Watu no paipi Diga tika lolu koko koko Diga buke paka Kwa kumatota Ukuni ilu no koleji kunja lonje. Ukoko mi ile mfondi ingi. Tiza dala katebe mkwa sasa. Tapo dala katebe mkongota. Katie kewe na konga ndigo wako. Iyo. Honorable Directors of Programs, the Reverend Dr. Kubule who opened this function with devotions, Honorable Chair of Council, Mr. Andy Olin, and members of Council, the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Tom, and Management, Our Speaker of the Assembly, the Honorable Bale Gambete, our Minister in the Presidency, Minister Hadebe, our Minister of Science and Technology, Naledi Pando, our Minister of Higher Education, Dr. Nzimande, the Honorable Premier of this province, and MC, MEC is present, and the former Premier of the province. Her Majesty Queen Noloiso, ah, Noloiso, where now in love? Where now in love? Ndabezita! the chairperson of the House of Traditional Leaders, because Matanzima and other traditional leaders present, the Honorable Mayor, His Excellency Ambassador, Makenkesi Stofile, the Matthews family, 
vice chancellors from other universities, other distinguished guests, fellow alumni, students, comrades all. Nkwati, Secretary General of the African National Congress. Kabazele, Treasurer General of the African National Congress. I forgot to address the Chairperson of the African National Congress. Fellow South Africans, standing here today, I feel the weight of 100 years of history. Here in these halls and classrooms, great men and women were molded and prepared before they burst forth to claim their destiny. Here, they wrestled with the questions of life, with the ideas of man, and the principles of faith. Here, they laid claim to knowledge, equipping themselves bit by bit for the battle that lay ahead. That battle was a battle against circumstances and ideologies. But more than that, it was a battle for freedom. I'm humbled, fellow South Africans, to have walked among some of the greatest minds to emerge from the university. To have known giants like Nelson Mandela, Ah Dalibun, Cesar Tehama, Tokentato Mochana, Miss Sally Maunye, Miss Duma Nogwe, Miss Tiny Malangabi, Mr. Ken Temba, Alfred Hutchinson, Mr. Joe Vincent Haubaki Matthews, Mr. Robert Mangalisa Sobugwe, Mr. Robert Gabriel Mugabe, Dr. Munya Wayaki, Dr. Njoroke Mungai, Mr. Oton Chirwa, and Mr. Nsumo Hedle. This list is too long to continue. But of these names, during my time at Forte, I was influenced most profoundly by one man, and one man only, the professor we affectionately called ZK. I'm therefore honored today to deliver the memorial lecture on Professor Zachariah E. Dirilang Leng Matthews as we celebrate the centenary anniversary of my alma mater, the University of Fort Hare. I must thank the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mvuyo Tom, for affording me this great privilege. To every student who attends Fort Hare, ZK is a household name. He was the first student, as we have heard, to have graduated from the university. But to people of my generation, his name brings to mind so much more. Educationist, orator, political giant, intellectual, husband, and man of faith. There are many aspects of, to the man. Before I venture on to account, or, to give you an account of his life, let me tell you about the ZK that I knew. I entered Forte in 1948, in the very year apartheid began. It was not surprising that our lecturers were filled with politics, and many of our black lecturers were politicians, including Mr. C.S. Ntogo Kaput, under whom I studied native law. Mr. Godfrey Piche, who chaired our fourth year branch of the ANC Youth League, and Professor Z.K. Matthews, under whom I studied Bando Administration, Roman Dutch Law, and Criminal Law. Professor Matthews happened to be the father of my dearest friend and, and fellow student, Joe Matthews. Professor Matthews was an impressive figure, almost intimidating, I must say. However, he had a wonderful sense of humor liberally offering many anecdotes to illustrate his point when he taught us. I remember, for instance, ladies and gentlemen, when he taught us about defamation, he regaled us with the tale of General Herzog, 
who was assaulted in the National Parliament in Cape Town, which prompted a Peter Marisberg newspaper called The Witness to print the headline, Served Him Right. General Herzog sued and was awarded damages for defamation. While remaining always the epitome of dignity, Professor Matthews didn't hide his disappointment or disapproval. I remember how he shook his head, sadly, as he reported that a conference of the said Afrikaans Fro Federasi had passed a resolution on the native problem. During one of our rag balls, we got to be aware of Professor J.K. Matthews, got to be aware of our youthful exuberances. On such occasions, we wore all kinds of garments, odd ones, I must say. We jived to the music of the students' band, the Varsity Swing Stars. I remember that Dumanogwe played the trombone. The professor seated there during that function, prim and proper, in black tie, was shaking his head ever so slightly at our antiques. On Monday morning, we attended his class of Roman Dutch law. He put some questions to us based on his last lecture, and we were blank. <laughs> he then said, stop doing all these nonsensical things you do in this place, which was a reference, you know, of our jiving at the red ball. And he added, he said, jive on your books, says. <laughs> and that says, of course, a reference to us was extremely embarrassing for me, and I felt very small. My years at Forte have a special place in my heart. I was naturally devastated when our political activities saw me rusticated in my final year. People don't understand the Queen's language. They say I was expelled from Forte. No, no, no. I was rusticated. <laughs> As the Youth League, we organized a boycott of the visit to Fort Hare by the then Governor General, Dr. G. Brand van Sale. Professor Matthews was not able to attend during that visit. He attended the funeral. But before he left, he told his son, Joe, that he hoped that the family would be well represented. Upon his return, of course, he discovered that Joe had been part of the boycott. Poor Joe was summarily chased out of the house and had to spend a fretful night in the room of his cousin Peter Matthews at Peter Hall. Ultimately, the university, of course, felt that making an example of three students was enough, unfortunately, as one of them. My uncle, Dr. Pixliga Isaga Seme, the founder of the ANC, wrote a letter to Professor Matthews, seeking his assistance to ensure that I completed my studies. Dr. Edgar Brooks, the principal of Adams College, also intervened. And the authorities at Fort Hare University were finally persuaded to let me write my exams in Durban at the University of Natal. I was accepted into the non-European section of the university run by a gallant lady called Dr. Mabel Palmer. I must say my friend Joe Matthews expressed his camaraderie during that time, even copying me out notes for me from the lectures at Fort Hare after my expulsion. Joe went on to make his father proud anyway, and he remained one of my lifelong friends. But let me now, ladies and gentlemen, turn from these reminiscences to expound on the remarkable life of Zachariah Q. Derilling Matthews. Z.K. Matthews was born into a time vastly different to the present. He was born at the turn of the last century, during the Second Boer War, when European colonists battled for control of the territories in our part of the world. The Act of Union lay ahead and did the, found, and did the founding of the South African Native Congress, later ANC, the passing of the Native Lands Act, the beginning of apartheid, and first awarding of the Nobel Prize for an African. Both within South Africa and across the world, 
history would be filled with momentous events during his lifetime. As an adult, ZK understood that these events were demanding a fundamental change in the human experience. On this matter, I would like to quote him. He wrote, while some changes are normal in every society, those that have taken place in the modern world in recent years can only be described as revolutionary. They have been rapid, widespread, and thoroughgoing. More changes have been packed into the last 50 years than have occurred in centuries in the past. They have affected the so-called Western world of Europe and North America, but perhaps even more drastically, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. They go to the root of every aspect of life. They call not for a minor tinkering with the social structure, the economic order, or the political system, but for a radical transformation of individual and group attitudes, ideas, and values. Not for a mere pouring of new wines into old bottles, but for a thorough rethinking and re-evaluation of the traditional in order to bring about the realignment of social, cultural, economic, and political life to achieve a new world order." Unquote. Zadkai Messus was part of that thorough rethinking and revaluation. His work brought change in perspectives and policies on matters as diverse as education throughout Africa and humanity's responsibility concerning refugees. He was a pioneer in many ways challenging the established view that a black man born into an impoverished family at the turn of the last century could not possibly amount to much. However, there is no one better equipped, ladies and gentlemen, to tell a man's life story than the man himself. And let me therefore read the opening words of Z.K. Matthews by autobiography entitled Freedom for My People. And I quote him, he said, the first white man I ever saw was a location superintendent named Bird. He was mounted on a white horse and wore a white uniform with brass buttons down the center of the tunic, a white helmet capped over his red face, and a pistol in a holster that hung from his belt. From where I peered up at him through the wire fence around our small yard, he looked like a giant, a fearsome giant who came from the dangerous well beyond the location, bringing pain and panic with him to our family and to all people among whom we lived and coach. With these beginnings, it is remarkable that ZK developed a firm belief in equality, the fundamental principle that all men are equal in the eyes of God underscored everything he thought, everything he said, and everything he did. At his wake, which I attended his funeral in Botswana, at his wake in 1968, as France paid tribute to his character, achievements, and intellect, the representative of Forte University, I think it was Mr. Makanya, I don't remember well, but I thought he was a librarian. He recalled what ZK once said, about race discrimination. Professor Matthew said he could tolerate discrimination between the educated and uneducated because the uneducated could at least be inspired by such discrimination to get some education. He could also tolerate some discrimination between clean people and dirty people because the dirty could ameliorate their situation with a piece of soap and water. <laughs> but he abhorred racial discrimination on the basis of color, as no one could help being born the color he is. And ZK's life was a testimony to his belief in equality. As I sat at his state funeral on the morning of the 18th of May, 1968, I thought to myself that there could not have been a better setting for the funeral of the man I knew. As I looked around Trinity Church in Gaberons, I saw members of the diplomatic corps, 
representing various countries, European, African, and even Chinese. A multiracial choir sang beautifully in Sichuana and in English. Sasarete Khama, the president of Botswana, and Lady Khama and the Botswana cabinet attended in the setting race, in race and color. Uh, in that setting, I'm sorry, race and color were completely irrelevant. So what shaped the exceptional character and beliefs of Z.K. Matthews, telling him from the boy peering through the wire fence into the man esteemed by presidents of the world? Let us look at his life briefly. Following his primary education at Lindhurst Public School in Kimberley, Z.K. attended Lovedale Training School. In 1918, he enrolled at the South African Native College, Kwano College at Fort Hare. It had been in existence for just two years and was under the competent leadership of Dr. Alexander Kerr. By the time I entered Fort Hare, Dr. Kerr, or Scary, as we called him, was in his final years in this position. Z.K.'s superior intellect coupled with hard work, ensured that he had no problems obtaining first metric and then a bachelor's degree. This degree was from the University of South Africa, as Fortier was then the University College of the University of South Africa. ZK went on to acquire a postgraduate diploma, which qualified him to teach. And I'm sure that this list of achievements sounds fairly standard, but one must appreciate, ladies and gentlemen, the novelty of it at that time. Z.K. Matthews was in fact the first black South African to obtain higher learning in our own country. Others had, had higher education, like Professor D.D.T. Chabavu, who lectured at Fort Hare before him, may have been the first to obtain, one of the first to obtain a Bachelor of Arts degree. But of course he studied outside South Africa. And I tell you an anecdote, at that time, if you had a degree, when we introduced, especially an African title, people would say, so and so, this is so and so BA, this is so and so BSC. So when they introduced Dr. Chabavu and said, this is Dr. Professor Chabavu, BA, he would say, don't forget London. <laughs> <laughs> so, ZK was blazing a trail, in other words. Upon for Leaving Fort Hare, ZK was appointed to the secondary school at Adams College in Natal. In course, Albert Lutuli was also teaching there at the time. Here again, ZK broke ground because he was first principal of a multiracial high school and it placed him in leadership over a staff of all race groups. In everything, ZK followed his own convictions, including matters of the heart. When he fell in love with Miss Frida Bogwe, whom he had met at Fort Hare, he disregarded the Sutunguni divide and proposed marriage. It proved a wise decision, for their marriage was a blessed partnership that lasted a lifetime. A year after their wedding, they celebrated the birth of their son, Joe Vincent Haubaki Matthews. Mrs. Frida Matthews was a great match for ZK. She, in fact, became one of the first black women to earn a degree within South Africa. And I remember when she graduated, Dr. Van Rijn, who was a deputy minister in parliament in, 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 this, in, in, in the South Cabinet, was then a chancellor of the University of South Africa. At that time, it was the policy of the government not to shake hands with black people. So members of the, of the opposition taunted Van Rijn after that the graduation that he, 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 he conferred a degree on a black woman. He said, no, but I didn't touch her. <laughs> <laughs> the Reverend John Knox Borgwe was instrumental in the founding of Fort Hare. Having worked for years for Dr. James Stewart, Frida was remarkably accomplished and was well able to stand at her husband's side throughout his great career. Today, their legacy of achievement continues in their granddaughter. You have just seen it for yourselves the Honorable Minister Naledi Pando, with whom I've had the privilege of working in the National Assembly and in the Cabinet. <laughs> Newly a father and working as principal of Adams, ZK continued studying on his time, on his, on his own time. He was also active in the Natal African Teachers Union, NATU, 
together with Bishop Alfio Zulu, and of course Albert Lutuli. ZK became the first president of that union. In 1930, he earned his bachelor degree in law from the University of South Africa. Three years later, he received a scholarship for the University of Yale, and the Matthews family left for the United States. Within a year, ZK graduated Master of Arts, and the family moved again, this time to London. There, at the London School of Economics, he studied social anthropology under the great Polish anthropologist, Professor Br Bronislaw Malin Malinowinski. At that point, South Africa received a gift. We received a gift at that time that should be, not be overlooked. An academic of that case caliber could well have remained outside our country, but he returned home. And shortly thereafter, Dr. Alexander K. welcomed him back to Fort Hill, now as a lecturer in native law and social anthropology. It was during his time as a lecturer that ZK joined the African National Congress. Within three years, he was elected to the ANC's National Executive Committee of the ANC. That same year, 1943, ZK was elected also to the Native Representative Council created by the then Prime Minister of South Africa, General Leanne Smarts. The council had been designed to advise government on the framing of legislation for African people. Alan Payton writes of ZK's appointment as follows, and I quote him. He, here, he says, here was another man whom fate was forcing into a mold for which his temperament did not fit him. By nature, he was deliberate and gentle with none of the tricks of the demagogue. That is in, in the biography of J.H. Hofmeyer on page 438. That is not to say, ladies and gentlemen, that he was not perfectly capable. Professor Matthews could be acerbic in a very gentle sort of way. I remember, for example, how he summed up the philosophy and policies of Prime Minister Jan Smarts. <laughs> he said that the policies of Smarts reminded him of a few lines in the first stanza of the hymn, Lead Kindly Light. I think Christian will remember that. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see. That distant sin, one step enough for me. <laughs> Mr. Oliver Walker, in his book entitled Kefas Are Lively, writes about the council as follows, quote, the council was a lively body of men whose speeches on national issues made more sense than the hot air breathed in Cape Town's House of Assembly. There was Mussolini Dome Professor Z.K. Matthews, holder of several degrees from white universities, who was then on the staff of Fort Hare. He was suavest of debaters, an ideal chairman, and a rare pourer of oil on troubled waters." Unquote. Now, this characteristic of ZK, this preference to reconcile opposing views rather than enforcing a rigid code of rules, was appreciated by his students. Often he would remind us, and I have never forgotten it, he would always say, there are two sides to every issue, he would say. By the time I, st I started at Fort Hare, he had been promoted to head of the Department of African Studies, taking over from retired Professor Didi Kiawahu. He was serving as vice principal of Fort Hare, in other words, second in command to Skerry. During my second year of studies, he succeeded Reverend Canon James Galata as president of the Cape Branch of the African National Congress, also a very dear friend of mine. I wish I could say that he received support as a member of the NRC, NRC Native Representative Council. Instead, he experienced great opposition for many quarters. The council was having little influence on government, which frustrated ZK Matthews and other colleagues of his enormously. But he believed in changing the system from within and would not compromise his principles by giving in. He was certainly not doing it for the money. Most members of council received just a paltry 10 pounds. But there was a great debate at that time raging across South Africa on whether participating in government created creature structures was right or wrong. Many called 
for ZK to resign from the council. Some students at Fort Hare pinned notices to the board at the college, accused him of being a stooge because he had not resigned. Ironically, many whites consider him an extremist and even a communist. But the actual communists resented him deeply for his participation on the council. There was a newspaper which was actually which circulated here at the university called The Torch, which was published by Trotskites, you know, supposedly edited by a certain Dr. Ben Keyes. On one occasion, I remember it reported on a meeting that had taken place in Port Elizabeth, which was addressed by the Reverend Skomolo, a chaplain of the ANC. The report of the torch went like this. The Reverend Skomolo delivered a fiery address, but he forgot that on the same platform from which he was speaking, there were those who had developed pot bellies from crumbs that fall from Pharaoh's table, unquote. This, of course, was a snipe at ZK. The burning question, the burning, the burning question among revolutionaries at the time has been perfectly framed by the late Professor Herbert Vulagazi, whom we laid to rest in Pretoria on Saturday. He expressed it during the 2013 Nelson Mandela Memorial Lecture as follows, and I quote from the lecture. He said, the most crucially important question was what should be the attitude of the liberation movement towards these structures and towards the individuals in leadership positions of these structures. Should revolutionaries boycott these structures? Should they send some of their people to work inside these structures? Should revolutionaries refuse to cooperate with these structures on specific issues? Should the individuals working within these structures be considered, considered enemies of the struggle for liberation? Should these leaders be attacked the same way revolutionaries should attack the white oppressors, oppressive state? Should the individuals leading these structures be identified as the same with these white oppressors? Should revolutionaries boycott reactionary institutions at, that t at the time? Are there times and conditions when revolutionaries shall be obligated to work within reactionary institutions, unquote? Well, no less a person than our hero. No less a person than our hero, Nelson Mandela himself, answered these questions. In 1958, in a piece called Our Struggle, needs many tactics. That was the title of his article. And Madiba wrote, in some cases, therefore, it may be correct to boycott, and in others it may be unwise and dangerous. In his struggle for the attainment of his demands, the liberation movement avails itself of various political weapons, one of which might not necessarily be the boycott. It is therefore a serious error to regard the boycott as a weapon that must be employed at all times and in all conditions, unquote. Subsequently, in his book, Matiba entitled No Easy Walk, No Easy Way to Freedom, Mandela argues that it was not treachery to serve in government created institutions. This is echoed by the words of Mrs. Walter Sisulu, who wrote while in prison, and I quote him, one of our greatest mistakes is to see in every man and woman who works within these apartheid institutions an enemy of the revolution. One must remember that Inkosil Tuli also served in the Native Representative Council, as did Ms. A.W. Champion, Mr. Paul Mosaga, and the Zulu region, my uncle, my mother's brother, Prince Mshenga Zulu, also Ikumgani Victor Porto of Western Pondoland. I'm just reminded of Mr. Champion, who was actually a founder of the ICU together with Kadali. Joe and, and myself, since Joe chose one of our beauties as his wife, when he was in Durban, we would always go to see Mr. Champion. And he always said some things to us. We would sit at his feet, and he would say to him, this idea of preparing speeches, he abhorred. He said, I don't prepare any speech. I look at the eyes of the people, and I speak accordingly. Mm -hmm. 
despite enormous pressure, ZK never resigned from the council. But on the 14th of August, 1946, the council took the decision to adjourn Sinedai. Shortly thereafter, ZK penned a comprehensive pamphlet which was titled Reasons Why the Native Representative Council in the UN of South Africa Adjourned. In his final section, ZK wrote, the patience of the council was obviously near breaking point and an adjournment of the council for an indefinite period until the government showed evidence of its intention to give more serious consideration to the views of the council seemed the least drastic action that the council could take. The reputation of the council has suffered as a result of the government's attitude towards it. The view has been expressed that this experiment in political segregation has been given a fair trial by the African people during the last decade and that the time has come for them to recognize that the experiment failed and to embark upon a boycott of the scheme. This is mentioned to indicate that the councillors are not in advance of their people in drawing the attention of government to the fact that all is not well, unquote. Despite the council's adjournment, the debate continued over whether ZK should have resigned. As students who were members of the ANC Youth League, our branch at Fort Hay, for ZK, of course, were not only just our professor and vice principal, but ZK was also the president of the Cape Province, of the ANC in the Cape, in what was then called the Cape Province. So he was our provincial political leader. As the students went on to and fro debating whether he should have resigned, Joe Matthews stood up and said, why don't we invite him so that we can ask our questions? Of course, neither Joe nor I were keen on debating Professor Matthews, for we knew that all of us would come off second best. Perhaps our friends knew that too, for some of them murmured dissent. But then Joe said, are you scared to invite him? So they got angry and said, call him, call him. So Professor Matthews was gracious enough to, to attend our meeting of the ANC Youth League and face the students, his students' interrogation. He patiently explained that they had boycotted the council by arresting its machinery from within. One of our senior members in the Youth League, Ms. Nsu Mokhetle, then got up. Ms. Mokhetle was an MSc graduate in zoology who was doing a diploma in teaching. And he later became, of course, the Prime Minister of Lesotho. Ms. Mo Ms. Mokhetle had a very aggressive style. He said, Professor, do you believe in democracy? Professor Matthews, in his calm and cool style, said, yes, Ms. Mokhetle, I do. Except that sometimes I have no confidence in the demos, i.e. the people. Because it is not so much the hands one counts when it comes to voting that matter, but the heads behind them. What should I tell you, ladies and gentlemen? Thus ended the debate. I remember writing in the World newspaper in 1976 that as students, we criticized severely some some of the political stances of great political leaders of our youth. Yet still we respected them profoundly. It was experience once we were out of the world that it made us understand these leaders. Zerke's work was not only political, he was a great educationist and sought to broaden the horizons of Africans across the continent through higher education. Together with Dr. Kerr, the principal of Forte, ZK was appointed to the Dilawa Imperial Commission on Higher Education in East Africa and Sudan. Among the nine commissioners, they alone had any experience of African education, and their contribution greatly influenced their British colleagues. Dr. Kerr later wrote of his admiration for ZK's skill as an advisor. Then, of course, there was his, his faith as a Christian. He was a committed Christian and worked diligently for the church. I remember there was a stainless, a stained, rather a stained glass window in the chapel at Beda Hall, depicting St. Bede, the classical scholar who translated the Bible. 
from Latin to English. At his feet, looking up in rapt attention, was a young disciple. The artist had used Bishop William Edmund Smythe, the first warden of Peter Hall, as inspiration for the face of St. Pete. But the disciple's face belonged to no, more, to no other person than Z.K. Matthews. I don't know whether he's still there. During his student days at Fort Hill, Z.K. had developed a great friendship with Bishop Smythe. Among many things, he appreciated that under Bishop Smythe, Peter Hall alone had no rule about lights out. This was to the envy of other hostels, and particularly conducive to ZK's education, for he preferred studying in the quiet of the night, often staying up to three or four in the morning. In 1952, while serving as principal of Fort Hare, ZK worked for a year at Union Theological Seminary in New York as a visiting professor. At that time, the relentless barrage of legislation to extend racial discrimination had prompted the ANC and the Communist Party to launch the defiance campaign with the aim of mobilizing the widespread defiance of curfews, past laws, and segregated amenities. Of course, Albert Lutuli, our president general then, who was elected president in 1952, gave his support to the principle of mass action. However, sadly, the, the defiance the defiance campaign soon petered out, as one after the other, its organizers were banned or imprisoned. The next major breakthrough was when Professor Z.K. Matthews proposed the idea of an assembly of the people at a conference of the ANC in the Cape. The purpose of the assembly was to adopt a freedom charter, which primarily affirmed that South Africa belonged to all its inhabitants, black and white. The charter demanded a non-racial de democratic system of government and equal protection of all before the rule. It famously proclaimed South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and no government can justify, can justly rather claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. As one of his drafters, ZK's ideological fingerprints are all over that document. With this level of involvement in our struggle, it is not surprising that Skay was among the 156 activists who were arrested in December 1956, who stood accused at the treason trial. My friend Joe was among them, as was Inkos Albert Lutuli. Inkos Albert Lutuli later wrote the following, and I quote him, the treason trial must occupy a special place in South African history. That grim pre-dawn raid deliberately calculated to strike terror into hesitant minds and impress upon the entire nation the determination of the governing clique to stifle all opposition made 156 of us, belonging to all races of our land, into a group of accused, facing one of the most serious charges in any legal system." Unquote. I admired my professor tremendously for the way he handled these tribulations. He emerged from it utterly unembittered. Years later, in 1975, Mrs. Frida Matthews asked Professor Monica Wilson to edit the her late husband's autobiography and pen a memoir. Professor Wilson was among those who had penned a tribute to ZK shortly after his death. In that tribute, she recalled ZK's composure and fortitude throughout his detention and trial. She wrote, and I quote her, the judge who tried him for treason and acquitted him congratulated him at the end of the case on the manner in which he had given evidence. He could view even his own case with an astonishing measure of objectivity. And I remember a sunny day after he had come out of jail when he told of the absurdities of that period of imprisonment without a trace of malice. It was in the manner of a soldier returned from battle who can yet recall the comradeship and the jokes." Unquote. Once acquitted, ZK returned to Forte, but these were se seismic changes. There were seismic changes on, on the horizon at this, at this university. Because in 1959, the apartheid regime passed the Extension of University Education Act to establish separate university colleges for Africans, Colors, and Asians. 
Viz and Cape Town University were no longer open to Africans, and Fortier would be exclusively for Tosa speaking students. For us black people, we were even split on ethnic basis. Control of Fortier was then taken over, taken away from its multiracial governing council and given to the Minister of Boundary Education with the powers to dismiss staff. Professor Matthews was two years away from retirement. He loved his work at Fortier, but ultimately he felt he could not compromise his principles, and he resigned. In doing so, he lost both his job and his pension. For a while after that, he earned a living practicing as an attorney in Alice, before taking up a position as secretary of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. He traveled up and down Africa on behalf of Interchurch Aid, and together with a Hugh Foote, he investigated the plight of refugees. The report made, they produced proved profoundly influential and drew the attention of the United Nations to this important issue. Then came what I call his Swan, Swan, Swan Song, Swan Song. Then came what I call his Swan Song. When Botswana achieved independence on the 30th of September, 1966, Cesar Reyes became his first president. Cesar Reyes was a former student of Professor Matthews and knew his remarkable strengths. He quickly appointed Professor Matthews as Botswana's ambassador to the United States and representative of Botswana at the United Nations. Thus, Professor Matthews presented his credentials to President Lyndon B. Johnson and settled in Washington, and began discussing world politics with heads of state. Sadly, this appointment lasted less than two years before his health began to fail. At the youthful age, I call it, at the youthful age of 68, ZK passed away in Washington in May 1968. In a gesture of exceptional respect, President Johnson flew his mortal remains back to Botswana in the president's own plane. Soon after his death, I was asked to write an article for a magazine which was published in Love Day called South African Outlook. Let me quote from my article in the Outlook, which I entitled His Death. In part, it read as follows. I wrote, after the funeral service, one of the longest cottages I have ever seen wound its way to the outskirts of Haberons, where the cemetery is. The rites at the graveside were performed by Bishop Skelton. There were hundreds of people of all races from all parts of South Africa and the world, from Botswana and Lesotho. Mrs. Frida Matthews was the very personification of composure and dignity in a grief, as were her children. Joe supported his mother throughout the service at the graveside. Dr. Matthews, the brother, surviving them brother, expressed thanks for all on behalf of the family. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, was laid to rest one of the greatest leaders I've ever had the privilege to know in my lifetime. I thought it was absolutely marvelous that during the latter part of, of his life in service of God and his fellow men, Dr. Zachariah Hugh Derilling Matthews should have died in harness, serving a non-racial country in a non-racial setting, something he always strove for, even in his own country. Today, as we celebrate the centenary of University of Forte, it is fitting that we remember the exceptional life of Professor Zachariah Q. Derilling Matthews. At this juncture in history, our country wrestles with contentious issues of tertiary education. Across South Africa, our institutions are seized with a debate on access to education, student fees, the outsourcing of university employees, student revolts, and the role of historical names and statues. Politics is playing a heavy role in the direction of this debate. Thus, education is flung in an ocean of turbulence. What then can be the individual student hold on today? What can inspire hope in the young man or woman who pursues education for education's sake, whose intellectual capacity cries out to be filled, and whose thirst for knowledge transcends all other considerations? Their anchor is this, that it can be done. 
Zelkay Matthews blazed a trail, pursuing higher education when the consensus among those in power was against him becoming anything at all. He went from impoverished streets of Kimberley to the hallowed halls of the United Nations, and he did it through his own efforts, using his own capacity on merit. Thus, I would say to the students at Fort Hill in 2016, please heed this example. Let it be an inspiration to you as you pursue not just a degree, but a life of learning. Respect the education offered to you at the university. Show respect to your lecturers and professors. A university education is the beginning of your destiny. How you achieve it will forever speak of your own character. This, in my view, is the legacy of Z.K. Matthews. I cannot help but wonder how a leader of his caliber would view the present stage of the party, party that he served and the country he loved. How would he have felt about Polokwane and Mangaung? What would his reaction have been to the depth of corruption that pervades our climate government at all levels with the hardships we face in South Africa, from a failing economy to drought, unemployment, and increasing social unrest, the danger of an implosion is ever present, and the threat of demagoguery is upon us. Those of us who love our country attempted to abandon hope, but ZK would undoubtedly have reacted by calling for calm and urging us to maintain hope. In the darkest hour, I'm always reminded of a favorite quote from my late friend, Sir Lawrence van der Post. He loved to quote Robert Louis Stevenson when, we talked, when I talked with him, who wrote, it is better to travel in hope than to arrive. Now, more than ever, we need the kind of leadership that ZK provided, calm, strong, reasoned, and predicated on a genuine belief in equality. The present challenges demand that we be more cerebral than emotional. I see our speaker is here. You remember that they described the parliament during the past that there was a lot of hot air. I'm not sure whether ours is, is actually is hot, hot, air, hot air today. I'm reminded also of my professor of history here at Fort Hill, Professor Chapman, who when he was telling, teaching us about feudalism, he would at the end, feudalism was Confucian roughly organized. <laughs> we need a measured intellect of a ZK Matthews. For the sake of South Africa, I pray that God will provide. I thank you. Because you see a lady Africa. <laughs>